You're listening to Making Money Online with Lisa Johnson, the podcast that tells you what it really takes to build a business and the simple steps to get you there. I'm determined to share with you the reality of easy, simple business marketing tips to make passive income so that you can start making money online. Making Money Online is sponsored by Nicola J. Rowley PR, helping entrepreneurs and brands in the leisure and entertainment industries get visible through strategic storytelling. If you're serious about being seen and impacting the lives of others, harnessing the power of PR is the best way to grow and scale your business. Visit nicolarowley.com for more details and read Nicola's Amazon best-selling book, The Power of PR. Hello, welcome to today's podcast. I hope you're having a lovely week. We're going to talk a little bit about mental health today. You know, it's a subject that I talk about a lot. I think it's important that we drop the stigma and start talking about it more because then more people can be helped. And so I have an expert with me today. I've got Hayley Wheeler here. Hayley helps children and adults improve their mental health. She has a system that she uses, which we'll go into later on during this podcast. But as with so many brilliant experts that do brilliant things for people it usually starts with them and their story so let's dig into that welcome to the podcast Hayley thanks Lisa lovely to be here really nice to see you so I'm gonna assume as happens with most people that because you now help people with mental health issues there were some mental health issues with you or your family talk to us about how that started yeah so in 2010, it kind of started with me. Prior to that, I'd had two bouts of postnatal depression, but I got over them. You know, I think as you do with postnatal depression, they come and they go with the baby. Then in 2010, I started to find things being more difficult to do. So just coping was a bit more difficult. And I invested in learning as my coping mechanism. So I ended up going to college. I had four children. I was in college, I was working full time and I was doing four other courses at the same time. That's a lot. So that was how I, <laughs> that's how I coped. That's how I, and I didn't realise that it, it at the time. Every night I was doing something. So I'd put the kids to bed and that was keeping my mind busy. So at that time I was only sleeping two to four hours a night maximum, but still doing okay with lack of sleep. I don't know why. So then as as I got to the end of the teaching, which was the two-year course, I was all learned out. I just couldn't learn anymore. And giving that up really meant I had more time to start thinking about things and or not thinking about things as the case may be. And I just found life getting harder and harder. So in 2014, I went to see a counsellor for something else. And she, on the last session, I didn't know it was the last session. She decided to tell me that she didn't, she couldn't help me anymore. She didn't want to see me anymore. But if I needed help to come back at the same time, she made the observation that I had impacted my children. And at the time I was struggling so bad that being a good mum was the only thing that was kind of holding me together. So that observation absolutely annihilated me. So I went on my way took another six months sort of into January um, and then in the July of 2015, that's when I hit rock bottom the first time. We'd gone to France and they'd cancelled our holiday and that broke me. That was like the, the straw that broke the camel's back. Yeah, it was never, it's never that one thing, is it? It's just the, the trigger of it. Yes, and then my, my daughter was like, why are you crying? And I, I very rarely cry. I was not a crier. So I knew that I'd hit my rock bottom. And I love holidays. I love being in the sunshine, but I just didn't want to be there. I just didn't want to be with my children. I didn't want to be in the sunshine. I didn't want to be in the tent that we ended up having. And I knew that I, I suppose that's the first time I'd really acknowledged to myself that I was struggling because you just get on with things. Yeah. Then in the October, my son was 11 at, the, at that time, my second son. Now, he'd been born with anxiety and I hadn't realised it. So all through his life, I kind of punished him for having these temper tantrums that he had and finally realised that it was anxiety and panic attacks and he was having eight to nine a day. So this, in the October, I had this absolutely devastating thought that knocked me off my feet. And I knew that I either had to walk away from my family or do something. So he became my motivator. I had to help him because I knew that if at some point he found drugs, he was going to love drugs because he had this addictive personality. 
So I helped him overcome his anxiety and depression. It was one of these, his anxiety, it was one of these things of trying to get him to explain what was going on to me so I could help him. It was a, a lot of back and forth. Yeah. But I started to understand anxiety and how it was impacting him. And about three months into using this tool that I'd used for him, or sort of devised for him, it sort of, it happened. We had a, an incident with a sheep and it happened for him that he completely understood it. And in the September of 2016 was his last panic attack in the schoolyard wow. going to the pump on my shoulder crying. That was his last one. How old was he? He was 11 then, but he'd lived with anxiety. He thought everybody was the same. He didn't know any different. I'd had a... Um... I had no idea that you could be born with anxiety. Well, I'd had a really stressful pregnancy and there was a birth trauma. Both of us nearly died in the cesarean. We, it was a real... But nobody ever explained after, like nobody... Nobody said this could be an issue. Like he, it was a 25 minutes C-section, quick in, quick out. And I was up and walking within 12 hours and, and out to hospital as soon as I could. But nobody sat us down and or sat me down and said, look, this could have an impact on the baby. It could have an impact on you. And I had another child at home, so I just got on with it. Mm. And he was so different. He cried all the time from birth and none of my others did. And I, I've worked with children prior to that. I'd worked with children for 20 odd years. So I, you know, I understood children. I just didn't understand him. But looking back now, I can see the whole thing through his life as the panic attacks, what he was anxious about, what would worry him, why it took us five hours to go three hours down the road because he would pee all the time. There were things like you, I just didn't think about. And then when I had this realisation... It was so easy to see the patterns because children are very different. They present differently. So they present as behavior issues mm -hmm. as opposed to sort of anxiety. And then just trying to get him to understand it. It's funny now. I can look back now and I can laugh now. At the time, it was not funny. But now I look back and he doesn't remember it. But I remember everything. I bet. Once he was better and he was, you know, he'd had his last anxiety attack. He'd settled into school. It was my turn. So it took me a further two years. I I didn't consciously opt for no medication, but I opted to self-develop and learn about depression, learn about myself. And sort of a year in, I felt a lot better and I felt like I'd stabilised. And then another year of doing the same sort of, you know, two steps forward, 10 steps back, I found happiness again. And that was a completely different level again. With the way that you helped your son and then helped yourself... You devised a method to help and it worked on you too. Did you then think, well, I can help other people with this? Yes. Yeah. And I think because the system is broken, like when I, on my second bout of postnatal depression, I'd gone to see a health visitor. She wasn't mine, but I told her, I think I've got postnatal depression. And she ran around the room as if she'd never heard it before, as if she was in panic. And you know, like I can see it in slow motion now. She didn't once sit me down and say, are you okay? She didn't once stop. And, and the minute she got my 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 prescription for bibliotherapy, go and pick up some books and um, a referral to counselling, which never, it never materialised. She wanted me out that room. Yeah. So, you know, we are talking, my daughter's 16, so we are talking, well, nearly 17. It's no 17. different now, by the way. So I, <laughs> I have been diagnosed with depression and anxiety for most of my adult life. Right. And if I have a new doctor and I talk about it, the only thing they care about is medicating me. I know. That's it. I, I see a lot of clients who are told either you're not bad enough or use the medication. I had one client come, which is really worrying. He'd only been on medication three three weeks, and he was like, "I can't, I can't not, I can't come off this medication now because I feel like it's doing me good." But to be that sort of hooked on something so quickly, and not, and maybe not necessarily physically hooked on it, but he was already mentally hooked on this thing. Yeah, because and I you, a lot your mindset, isn't it, believes that you then need it. I, I'm not on any medication for it now, but I can totally see how people grasp on to the fact that if they don't have it, it will be bad again. Absolutely. And I think they're so quick to give medication. We're sort of born into a system of medicating, and we, we, we know that, you know, Calpol, you start at two months now, you, you start medication before you're even are consciously aware of, of your decisions. But I don't know why I didn't go to the doctor. I didn't go and see the doctor. I had physical symptoms. So when I was depressed, my back was bad. I did go into spasm, um, tension in the shoulders, headaches. 
and all that's gone. And I know when I'm stressed, my back, I get tweaks in my back. So there's physical correlations. But I just think the system is so broken now that that people are still reliant on it, unfortunately, that people still wait for it to work. Yeah, and actually it's dangerous because there are so many people that now can't see anyone about their mental health. I know people that have been told they're on wait lists and all sorts of different things on the NHS to, to get there, and they don't necessarily know of any other way to help themselves. So you help other people. Talk us through your method of what has worked for your clients. So the way I work with clients, both adults and children, and, you know, they are the same issues with adults or children. It's just they've got less baggage often, but they're the same issues. So I have a system where I look at emotional processing, express and releasing. Now, that's the main thread that we work on because that's the thing that doesn't happen in therapy now. They don't... They we will talk around emotions, but we never talk through processing them. So by doing that, we then get to understand our value system, our beliefs, self-esteem, our emotional patterns, our behaviours. So we work on all this kind of holistic development. It's never one thing, is it? It's never just, you know, the emotional side or the mental side. It's everything. And I think we've forgotten the emotional side as part of mental health. We talk a little bit more about mental health now, but for me, if we don't address emotional issues, which is very much what we want to ignore, then we're not getting anywhere. So the way I do it is I empower them to understand themselves as opposed to me doing any of the work. So I get to hold hands and I get to facilitate. I get to teach them skills because I use coaching, mentoring, teaching and counselling all in all. So I get to teach, coach and mentor these people through understanding themselves. When they get to the end, they have not just the skills, they have the self-knowledge to go and apply all the skills as well. Yeah, because a lot of the time people don't have that. Like if they've not been in the self-development world, you don't have the ability to kind of understand yourself very well. So let's talk panic attacks, because when my son first had a panic attack, it terrified me. I'd never seen anything like the fear that he went through and I couldn't get him out of it. Like it took minutes before I could get even get eye contact with him to get him out of it. How do you help kids who, you know, we can to a point reason with ourselves. I think kids find that much more difficult to reason with themselves to come out of this. How do you deal with that? So it's, it's really about the emotional safety and not feeling emotionally safe, but people don't understand it because I've got a T-shirt that says anxiety is where the fear is real, but the danger is not. But you can't see that when you're face to face with fear, whatever that looks like, it's really scary, which is why it's all consuming and, and they just you lose them for that time. But by so that, when they come to me, it's usually because they have a full emotional vessel and by emptying the emotional vessel, those are the things that that allow us to cope. So if you've got a full emotional vessel, you can't cope very well. So everything feels like it's getting on top of you. So when you empty the emotional vessel, there's a coping capacity that opens up that now when things happen, you're not feeling so overwhelmed with things. Your body's a bit calmer, your mind is a bit calmer, and you're happier in general. So those panic attacks kind of disappear. But if you're in it, the way to deal with it is just to let it ride out. That is there's no, yeah, there's no getting through to people. I have a coaching model and I say to people, practice it beforehand to become a skill, but never try and use it when you're in a panic attack because it doesn't work. And you you put pressure on yourself to to try and do these things while you're panicking when actually you just can't. Yeah. So if you let it ride out and then do the reflective work after. Yeah, that's such a good idea. How long do you think it takes? Like if somebody comes to you, either adult or child with anxiety, and they know that they need to make a change. They want to get rid of feeling this way because it can affect businesses massively. I've seen it affect businesses. How long does it take for someone to start feeling better? From day one. Okay. So from the usually from the intro session, I have results from there where people, because in my intro session, I, I make sure they walk away understanding why they feel the way that they do. So that is a real big thing because we don't tend to understand ourselves. 
And then when I take them to session one, so children tend to be three sessions and they're finished. They've done the whole program and they feel a lot better. And I, I see the results every session. They, they're better the way they say things, the things that they say, they don't, they don't realize sometimes. Adolescents are four sessions and they can be, if we can do it on a week by week basis, they can be done within four weeks, but it tends to have sort of, they tend to have more two weeks in between. And then adults is about three months because each of the sessions with the adults can be up to four hours long. Wow. So I'm not an hour done. You come until, you know, there's homework every week. So you come until the homework is done and we've gone through it and you've processed everything. And I think that's part of the reason why it's so successful is they're not watching the clock. You know, 50 minutes, you tend to watch the clock. They're not watching the clock because they know they've got enough time. And I set that time aside because the thought of doing it alone, I did it alone. I did everything myself. And I don't regret that because it's taught me so much about myself. But the thought of somebody else doing it alone it's heartbreaking for me. Yeah, because you know what that feels like. When you talk about processing things, is that processing things that you might have felt from childhood or things that happen as adults? Talk me through what you mean by processing. So it's everything. So the way I do it is I go back and we do a life reflection. So Instead of looking at what they've been through, we look at the emotional impact. And this is the key. This is the thing that doesn't get done in usual therapies is that they don't look at the emotional impact. They look at what they've been through. So when people come, they tell me their life story. Yeah. I get that in the queue. And that person who tells who gets that in the queues. But when they look at it from an emotional impact perspective, we're looking at what how it impacted you at the time. What happens to your thought processes? What happens to the way that you think about things and, and how you look at things, how you perceive things? And then we look at the long-term impact. So we look at, so say, for example, um, I'll give you one example of a client whose dad left at seven. She had really unhealthy relationships because she thought it was her fault that he left. So the long-term effect for that was that the short-term was she was hurt, she felt abandoned, rejected, longer term, there was still all those rejection and abandonment issues, but the the behaviours were all about health, unhealthy relationships and allowing men to take advantage of her. Because she didn't feel good enough. Because yes. she rejected. Yeah, it makes complete sense. And I think that we sometimes know up to a point that things could have had an effect on us. But I think what people do, and I've spoken to people who this has happened to, they think that in order for them to have, have anxiety, depression, trauma, has to be some big thing that has happened in their life. And actually, what you just said makes a lot of sense because it's the emotional impact on you. So you something small might have happened to, to another person that might have had no emotional impact on them, but to you, it might have had an emotional impact and therefore changed the way you think forever. And it doesn't have to be a big thing, does it? Like, I know from seeing a therapist myself, there have been tiny things that pe like parents have said or someone has said to me that has stayed with me for such a long period of time and altered my own view of myself. Whereas if I was a different person, that might have been said to me and I would have gone, yeah, whatever. And it wouldn't have even, you know, had an impact. Yeah, you're right. I think it's accumulative as well. And we, we forget that. We are always looking when you talk about trauma. And I'm like... I don't actually talk a lot about trauma or mental health through the program, funnily enough. It's, and it's only that's only I've realized that recently. But it's for me, it's about if we understand that that small thing that happened when we were five, if it keeps coming back up, then it's a problem emotionally. And when people when they start their life reflections, they say to me, What needs to be on there? Because I share everything. So every step I ask them to take, I share. So I will have give, gone through my life reflections with them before they do their years. And I'll say to them, if those things, are, those sort of memories keep coming back up, there's an emotional impact there. That when they start with those things, then they tend to identify lots of little things, lots of big things. And as you said, small things to other people can be really significant emotionally to you. But because of the way society is, they go, yeah, it happened. And I'm, 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 I love this one. I'm over it. I hear yeah. it all the time. Or I've dealt with it. And I say to them, well, why are you sitting on my sofa? If you've dealt with it and you're over it and they go, oh, OK, I'm not. Because <laughs> you can't just say you're over it. That's why. Like, I think if we're a nation, especially in the UK, of people that like to just sweep how we feel under a carpet and go, well, well, I'm over it. I'm just not going to think about that anymore. And we're I'm going to get on with my life and be fine. And it doesn't work that way. And I really had to go through a lot of 
having to go back and I, I didn't want to and come to terms with some things that had happened in my life. And I was definitely a person that would go, well, I can't be bothered with all that. Let's just move forward and everything will be fine. But patterns tend to, they're called patterns for a reason. It just carries on and on and on. You'll, you'll see yourself do the same thing that you've done 10 times before. And you'll be like, why am I still making the same mistake? And it's because you put all this stuff under the carpet and have pretended that it's not happening. Yeah, and I think as well that people assume that they've talked about it. I've talked, I've let you know, I talked to my friends about this, or I've talked to my parents about it, but they've never looked at the emotional impact. So when we do that work, it's hard for some people. I've only ever had to say to one person that if you don't take this step, I can't work with you because it's not going to work. Yeah. Because he found it really difficult to be emotionally honest with himself. Because how often are we actually emotionally honest with ourselves? You know, we talk about stress and but we never talk about what's the impact of stress on us? What's the impact of anxiety? Or what's the impact of just being anxious over this particular thing? And it can stay long term. But yet we, I suppose it's that stiff upper lip, isn't it? Just get on with it. And I, you know, I'm hearing more and more, well, you can change your emotions. The way I work, I don't think you can change your emotions until you've changed your thoughts, your, your self-talk and your behaviours. When you change those, those are the things that then indirectly change the emotions you feel about things. Yeah, because if you're saying you're changing an emotion, but you're still talking to yourself the same way and um, it, the emotional impact of whatever happened is still an emotional impact, then how does it change? Because you have to switch something off. And this is where people go to counselling and see short-term, they see short-term gains. They may feel better in the short-term because they've offloaded. And this is the thing, there's a top layer of emotions in your emotional vessel. They offload those and you feel better. But very quickly, because that space is so small, it fills back up. So you're on this roller coaster of up and down, feeling better, feeling worse, when you empty it. And you don't empty it completely because there's things you won't remember in your past. There's things from your childhood, you know, baby, even sort of hereditary things that you love, you won't know about. So you kind of empty it to about an inch, I say, in my the emotional vessel I have, I point about an inch. So there will still be things there, but when you've got a bigger capacity to cope, you can then you can, you can deal with things better. You can run your business better. You can you can run life. You can you can live the life that you want. Well, we can see that just on a basis of, you know, someone that is really busy in, in their business. There's things going wrong in the business. They've got too much on their plate. There's personal stuff going on at home. And then all it will take is one small thing and you can't cope with it. Whereas you and not people would go, well, you know, someone might say, well, this is what happened. Like my kid was a nightmare today and I just I completely broke down. And someone might go, my kid's a nightmare every day and that doesn't make me break down. But it's not that. It's all of the things piled up. There's no a capacity to take on one more problem. Yes. And I've been right. there and I know exactly how that feels. Um, whereas if you're, you know, pretty chill, in the rest of your life and one bad thing happens, you can cope with it more. And you can see it with a better, more clear, resilient mind as well, rather than it just feeling like way too much to cope with. Yeah, and if, and if you've offloaded the emotional impact, then you don't have that already layered up. Because people people get anger. Anger is a, an emotion that's acceptable in society. People don't think it is, but it's more acceptable than being sad. So you're more likely to show that you're angry or frustrated about something than you are sad. So where does sadness go? We push it down. So That's as so you're true. laying it in a... I, I've never thought about that, but actually people do think it's okay to show anger and rant, and but they don't often say, do you know what, I'm feeling really sad today. Well, it's people don't want to hear it. So even if you've never... If nobody's ever said you don't talk to me about that, you will know. Because if you're feeling vulnerable and you are feeling sad and you want to reach out to somebody, just their body language, the way that they turn their head, the way that they close their eyes, even they, you know that they do not want to talk about it. So you stop talking. So you're collecting those emotions. So sadness is not something hurt. People will talk about grief for a, a socially acceptable time. So it depending on whether you've lost a parent, a, a sibling or a child, there's different socially acceptable time limits. But there is a limit. Yeah, and that's society true. will tell you when you are now supposed to stop grieving and move on. But 
emotions don't work like that. Emo- whether it's anxiety, grief, or they don't just work like that. You don't just switch them off. And we, what we do is suppress them. And that suppression is what then fills the emotional vessel. Yeah, that makes so much sense. So if there is somebody that is feeling like anxiety, grief, and they need help with it, and they want to try something different, because I think some when people sometimes have been through the mill and they've tried all the things to try and feel better and nothing has helped, and then they come to you and they see a difference. So where is the best place for them to start with you? They can find me on Facebook. I'm Hayley T. Wheeler on all social media platforms. So I'm on LinkedIn as well. I've got a heavy presence on LinkedIn. But Facebook, definitely. Instagram, depends whether Instagram I'm not as present. So Facebook or LinkedIn would be the best ones to find me. But they can also come across my website. I've got www.emotionmindynamic.co.uk or they can email me on Hayley at HayleyTWheeler.co.uk. Amazing. We'll put all those links in the show notes for you as well. But please know that if you are feeling like your mental health isn't where you want it to be and you've tried things before, don't give up. There is always something that can help you out there. I've been there. So I know this, having tried lots of different things, that there'll be one way that clicks with you and that is able to help you, if not feel completely better, feel better than you are. So um, keep searching and don't give up on that. Thank you, Hayley, for being here and sharing your wisdom with us today. Thank you, everybody, for listening. I'll be back next week with another episode. I hope you have an amazing week. I'll see you then. Thank you for listening to Making Money Online with Lisa Johnson. If you'd like to get hold of my guide to launching, go to lisajohnson.com forward slash launch and let's get you making money online.